the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. In our last episode, we left off with the commissioners finding Mary Queen of Scots guilty. Their verdict was then delivered to Queen Elizabeth. And that's where we'll continue this story. Most of the subsequent steps taken by Elizabeth in this unhappy business are marked with the features of that intense selfishness, which, scrupling nothing for the attainment of its own mean objects, seldom fails by exaggerated efforts and overstrained maneuvers to expose itself to detection and merited contempt. Never had she enjoyed a higher degree of popularity than at this juncture. The late discoveries had opened to view a series of popish machinations, which had fully justified, in the eyes of an alarmed and irritated people, even those previous measures of severity on the part of her government, which had most contributed to provoke these attempts. The queen was more than ever the heroine of the Protestant party and the image of those imminent and hourly perils to which her zeal in the good cause had exposed her inflamed to enthusiasm the sentiment of loyalty. On the occasion of the detection of Babington's plot, the whole people gave themselves up for rejoicing. Sixty bonfires, says the chronicler, were kindled between Ludgate and Sharing Cross, and tables were set out in the open streets at which happy neighbors feasted together. The condemnation of the Queen of Scots produced similar demonstrations. After her sentence had been ratified by both Houses of Parliament, it was thought expedient, probably by the way of feeling the pulse of the people, the solemn proclamation of it should be made in London by the Lord Mayor and City Officers, and by the magistrates of the county in Westminster. The multitude, untouched by the long misfortunes of an unhappy princess, born of the blood royal of England and heiress to its throne, insensible, too, of everything arbitrary, unprecedented, or unjust, in the treatment to which she had been subjected, received the notification of her doom with expressions of triumph and exaltation truly shocking. Bonfires were lit, church bells were rung, and every street and lane throughout the city resounded with psalms of thanksgiving. But it was the weakness of Elizabeth to imagine that an extraordinary parade of reluctance and the interposition of some affected delays would change in public opinion the whole character of the deed which she contemplated and preserve to her the reputation of feminine mildness and sensibility without the sacrifice of that great revenge on which she was secretly bent. The world, however, when it has no interest in deceiving itself, is too wise to accept of words instead of deeds, or in opposition to them. And the sole result of her artifices was to aggravate in the eyes of all mankind the criminality of the act, by giving it rather the air of a treacherous and cold-blooded murder than of solemn execution done upon a formidable culprit by the sentence of offended laws." The Parliament which Elizabeth had summoned to partake the odium of Mary's death met four days after the judges had pronounced her doom, and was opened by commission. A unanimous ratification of the sentence by both houses was immediately carried, and followed by an earnest address to Her Majesty for its publication and execution. The statute, by requiring her to pronounce judgment upon her kinswoman, had involved her in anxiety and difficulties. Amid all her perils, however, she must remember with gratitude and affection the voluntary association into which her subjects had entered for her defense. It was never her practice to decide hastily on any matter. In a case so rare and important, some interval of deliberation must be allowed her, and she would pray heaven to enlighten her mind and guide it to the decision most beneficial to the church, to the state, and to the people. At length, on February 1st, 1587, Her Majesty ordered Secretary Davison to bring her the warrant, which had remained ready drawn in his hands for some weeks. And having signed it, 
She told him to get it sealed with the great seal, and in his way to call in Walsingham and tell him what she had done. Though, she said, smiling, I fear he will die of grief when he hears of it. Walsingham then being sick. Davison obeyed her directions, and the warrant was sealed. The next day he received a message from her, purporting that he should forbear to carry the warrant to the Lord Keeper till further orders. Surprised and perplexed, he immediately waited upon her to receive her further directions. When she chid him for the haste that he had used in this matter, and talked in a fluctuating and undetermined manner respecting it, which greatly alarmed him. On leaving the Queen, he immediately communicated the circumstances to Burley and Hatton, and thinking it safest for himself to rid his hands of the warrant, he delivered it up to Burley, by whom it had been drawn, and from whom he had at first received it. A council was now called, consisting of such of the ministers as either the Queen herself or Davison had made acquainted with the signing of the warrants. And it was proposed that, without any further communication with Her Majesty, it should be sent down for immediate execution to the four earls to whom it was directed. The news of Mary's execution was received by Elizabeth with extraordinary demonstrations of astonishment, grief, and anger. Her countenance changed, her voice faltered, and she remained for some moments fixed and motionless. A violent burst of tears and lamentations succeeded, with which she mingled expressions of rage against her whole council. They had committed, she said, a crime never to be forgiven. They had put to death, without her knowledge, her dear kinswoman and sister, and whom they well knew that it was her fixed resolution never to proceed to this fatal extremity. She put on deep mourning, kept herself retired among her ladies, abandoned to sighs and tears, and drove from her presence with the most furious reproaches such of her ministers as ventured to approach her. She caused several of the counselors to be examined as to the share which they had taken in this transaction. Burley was of the number, and against him she expressed herself with such peculiar bitterness that he gave himself up for lost, and begged permission to retire with the loss of all his employments. This resignation was not accepted, and after a considerable interval, during which this great minister deprecated the wrath of his sovereign in letters of penitence and submission worthy only of a slave, she condescended to be reconciled to a man whose services she felt to be indispensable. To relate again those melancholy details of Mary's closing scene, on which historians of England and of Scotland, as well as numerous biographers of this ill-fated princess, have exhausted all the arts of eloquence, would be equally needless and presumptuous. It is, however, important to remark that she died rather with the triumphant air of a martyr to her religion, the character which she falsely assumed, then with the meekness of a victim or the penitence of a culprit. She bade Melville tell her son that she had done nothing injurious to his rights or honor. Though she was actually in treaty to disinherit him and had also consented to a nefarious plot for carrying him off prisoner to Rome, and she denied with obstinacy to the last that the charge of conspiring the death of Elizabeth Though by her will, written the day before her death, she rewarded as faithful servants the two secretaries who had borne this testimony against her. A spirit of self-justification so haughty and so unprincipled, a preservation in deliberate falsehood so resolute and so shameless, ought under no circumstances and in no personage, not even in a captive beauty and an injured queen to be confounded by any writer studious of the moral tendencies of history and capable of sound discrimination with genuine religion, true fortitude, or the dignity which renders misfortune respectable. 
And that concludes part seven of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. In the next episode, we'll look at the aftermath of Mary, Queen of Scots' execution and the death of Elizabeth's favorite, Robert Dudley, as well as the rise of Essex. I'm Rebecca Larson. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.